All right, so um, we have today's court hearing. Um, sorry, I didn't do a uh, lunch update. Didn't have my phone um, fully charged. I had to wait till the end of the day, but sometimes that's better. We get a full update in one. So today when they got there, um, we were told by the marshals that there was something else going in the courtroom that was different. Um, different case. Uh, apparently it was, they were talking to the guys about their um, treatment by the marshals. Um, the way I hear it, uh, Ammon, there was some issue with Ammon. I'm not too sure about what happened. I think um, Lisa did an update that I haven't seen yet, so probably go to look for that about um, their treatment. And this is the treatment by the marshals when they come and go. Um, I did notice that uh, Cliven his wrists were um, pretty bad and uh, I guess bleeding today and so that was an issue. We definitely saw that there was a difference with the marshals and we're going back to the court like all through both of these um, trials. It, it's been a day by day basis on how we're being treated and how the rules change daily. Um, some of it comes down from what's going on. I'm guessing that the treatment of everyone today stemmed from what was going on in the courtroom. Um, it was definitely a different situation. The judge seemed different today as well. Um, she was a lot less lenient, not so happy today. I'm not sure, you know, they kept the, the courtroom sealed with just the guys and their lawyers. I want to say until 9.15 this morning. Um, they wouldn't hold anyone's cell phone like they were doing yesterday, those kind of things. So we're back into this, you know, some days are good days and you're treated well and then some days you come in and, and the rules just change daily. And um, what we were told by the marshals today is that this is the rules, this is going to be the way it is from here on out, don't even bring your cell phones in. You've got to keep them outside. and. So everything's changing. Um, we go into the courtroom and we're still in the evidentiary hearing. Now this hearing is to see, is based on motions from Ryan Payne and from Ammon, um, that there was destruction of evidence, ex um, exploratory or evidence that they needed, they should have been provided to fight their case, and that there was destruction of this evidence. Dan Love has been accused of destroying evidence in other trials. And so this is an evidentiary hearing. There's no jury. It was supposed to be a one day hearing to, and Dan Love came and he took an entire day. He did not come back today. The government did not get to cross examine him. I guess they just waived that. I don't think they're calling him back. So today we had Clayman. I believe he was from Idaho. He is a criminal investigator for the BLM. And he did the investigation into the destruction of evidence charges. He actually reports to Stephen Myrie. Um, Ammon's not in the courtroom for this part. Um, he, the way I hear it is in the morning meeting when it was closed, him and the judge had some time where they were talking over each other and she put him in the holding cell for the first part of the day. He does come back after lunch. Um, so Dan Hill talked about the identification of shredded documents because Ammon's um, motion actually had pictures of shredded documents, pictures of shredded documents on a table, pictures of them in a bag that was attached. Asking if he reviewed those pictures, there was also handwritten scra scraps in it. Um, at first the guy says, I don't recall the handwritten scraps. He shows him the pictures. Then he says, okay, there are some handwritten scraps in there um, or shreds. He says he identifies some of these items as uh, copies of the uh, operation plan, things, everything he, he claims everything in it would be backed up to the cloud. It's regular practice to have each of these officers have a copy of the plan. So there's many reasons that they would have extra copies and copies would be shred. Then we go back to the handwritten notes. Same kind of questions as yesterday. Would it be unusual to take notes during briefings? Well, of course not. Um, he was asked about starting investigations on the case before the destruction of documents came to light. And he said yes. Um, 
they talked about security concerns and risk assessments. Would risk assessments be passed around, possibly at the uh, debriefings? Um, he said bolo information, daily updates, briefing summaries, all of those things could have been printed and passed around at a briefing. Those were items that could have been um, shredded. Also, he said her policies, financial info, timekeeping, cattle updates, all those, the action plans were all things that would have been updated on, backed up on a cloud or the, the server and still shredded. So he's saying that these, he's saying that he's identified some of these documents as, from the shredded pictures as these documents and they are back to a cloud. And that these are copies that they may have like passed out to a bunch of people. Then he talks about the criminal justice information service policy. This is a policy made by the FBI. There's a lot of talk about his policy, the BLM policy, how well he knows the criminal justice information service policy, which is not very well because the BLM has a different policy. He also says he knows this information because Tony Siminski had given him that information as this was the policy that she was going by. It's a huge policy. He kind of skims through it and just reads the one part that kind of explains what she was saying. And so here we have a man investigating uh, shredding documents, going to the person who's shredding documents. She says, here's my policy. He reads the one portion of the policy and he, he's saying, okay, yeah. On, um, he's saying, your declaration, he wrote a declaration after his investigation, offers a justification for the shredding of these documents. And he says, no. And he says, not all of the shredded information falls under this policy. Myrie actually objects and moves to strike. And this is the guy's answer to a question. Myrie obstructs it and moves to strike. Um, he's saying he doesn't really know. He says he, st he starts reading the policy. He doesn't really know it. He, or Myrie starts reading the policy and says this gentleman doesn't really know it. And so then they have to go back and ask the question. He says, does this policy cover all the documents that were shredded? And the guy says no. Um, then they're talking about another lady, Miss Sanders, that sh her role, she was like a financial person. She kept contracts, um, time timelines, lots of those things. Her items would be shredded. Um, Dan Hill then wants to ask a question that was objected to and he wishes to proffer. He wants to ask why he did not talk to Dan Love during his investigation. In the declaration, it stated that uh, hurry shredding started on the 11th. The judge says he only spoke to seven people um, and why not people higher up than that? Myrie said it's, it's not relevant. Why didn't he talk to the man on the moon? Um, and I mean, Myrie is really throwing out these crazy things. You say, well, why didn't he just talk to the man on the moon? Well, why do you only talk to seven people and not their higher up? Um, I think if you're doing an investigation of this time and you, and you talk to seven people that may have been involved and they all have the same story, oh, that's, that's what he's saying. I talked to seven people, everything was good. We just kind of rubber stamped it. Um, he said from the people, one person to the next, they ha were painting a clear picture of what happened. And that's why he only asked seven of them. And um, Myrie then accused this of a fishing expedition. And he said, you know, we can just keep going on and on here and bring and just talking about everyone there. We can keep talking about Dan Love. We can keep talking about all these people. This thing could go on forever. Um, Myrie said, I, uh, let's see, he, he has not found out every document was shredded and not the handwritten documents has he identified. So he's saying he identified the majority but there's handwritten documents inside these pictures and that he hasn't identified everything and he's saying that no destruction of evidence happened. Myrie said, I resent this and he is misrepresenting uh, testimony. Um, that was gone over and over, and it is just not fair. So Myrie, the prosecutor, is throwing tantrums in the courtroom and saying, this is just not fair. Why didn't he question the man in the moon? Like, we're really getting to almost childish points here today. Um, he was asked if he looked into when and why the things were shredded, um, and what the circumstances were, because there, there's a policy on what you shred, but there's also policies on why and when you shred things. And so he said the investigation more went into what was shredded, not the why and the when. And they really, they really went into the P 
PII information, what kind of information you would tread, tread with things with phone numbers, um, with information of people's addresses and all of that. Um, so we go to Ryan Bundy. He asked, did you ever physically possess the documents so that you could go through them? And did you see some that had handwriting in the picture? He never physically possessed them. He never reached out to the people who took the pictures or the people who had the documents to actually secure that information and actually see if he could actually identify each piece. So they're asking, well, you talk to seven people, you don't even see the actual shredded evidence, and you're saying, yes, it's, it's all backed up. He said, could there have been more bags that you didn't see in the pictures? Um, also, the U.S. Attorney's Office were the ones instructing him to do, do the information. And he said to, he reports to the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, work, and they're the ones working on the case, and asked what the scope of the investigation was. And he said the shredded documents issue. He was asked how many shredders were on site, he doesn't know. And then he was also asked about missing information on the radio um, recording. And if the missing information that on the recording may have been handwritten by people because the recording wasn't recording from nine till on the most important day from nine until they left. So they're saying, you know, not only is there shredded documents, but this, there's also this radio communication thing that wasn't plugged in and they don't have any of that. Um, he can't really say what the handwritten things were. He didn't really look into that part of the pictures. Um, he also said, Tony Skaminski said that the radio recording was a human error. Like someone didn't plug it in or unplugged it and that is why it wasn't recording. So then we go into Myrie's cross-examination. And he's saying that um, he used the photos, he did not have access to the bags or the shredded documents. And so he just used the photos and did what he could. Um, do you know if the BLM put the bags there or if someone else did? He said, no, based on what you saw in the photos. Um, he doesn't know who took the photos, where the bags were, where the information was coming from. Then he went into this very interesting information. He said, well, did you ever see any documents that would prove the innocence of any of the men? And he goes, do you ever see any documents that were in the shredded pile that would prove the evidence of the innocence of Clive and Bundy. And he says, no, this is objected to by the other side. They say it goes to a legal standing. He can't say this. The judge is allowing this. He goes through and does this with each defendant and naming them off. Well, did you ever see something that could go to this person? And then they talk about um, protecting information and that maps were shredded and that those maps would still be on the database and be available. Um, they talked about MOA, MOAs, um, memorandums of activity, and that they were not involved in the shredding. And then, so after lunch, we go back into the redirect. And Norwood talked about Ammon's motion, and did you ever seek to contact Keith Gordon, the person who took the pictures or, or gained access, access to the shredded documents? You never tried to actually get those documents yourself. Um, you stated you talked to all the people and you believe their answers, so you didn't continue to check for more than seven people. He didn't need to feel the need to follow up to see if they were all telling the truth or other people had a different story. And you believe that every document that was shredded, they all exist on electronic copy. And he says, no, I can't say that. And he's all, can you say that every MOI and MOA has been given to the defendants? And he says, yes. And he's all, oh, well, you're not aware that several MOIs were just given to the defense after your testimony, and those are dated back to 2014. Um, that was kind of hushed, you know, rushed over, but it sounds like during today, while they were testifying, several MOAs were given to the defense that were dated back to 2014 that weren't previously given. So here we go. Again, and I know through Eric's first and second trial, we're not given all the evidence to um, fight our case, and a lot of the evidence is given like last minute. So then we go to Ryan Bundy. Was there no other investigation that was taking place during the cattle gathering? 
Um, he said he doesn't know of any, he, I know of reports being generated, but that there wasn't an actual investigation. But people were not writing statements or taking interviews until after the 12th. And then he asked about a, a, a warrant that was put out for Ammon on the 9th and then later immediately taken back. And then they go back into Dave Bundy's arrest in the iPad. This actual individual says the iPad, he gets to the end of the iPad, whether it was taken, they had a warrant to get the information off the iPad, and if he knows where the iPad went. He actually says he knows it was turned over to the FBI. And it was not um, taken under a search warrant. It was seized when he was arrested. I don't know how that works. I would think they still need a, a search warrant to go through it. Um, so he, you know, they're saying, well, we want the iPad back, and, and, and reason why you took this iPad, and you took this iPad on the 6th, and if there's no investigation going on, how are you taking this iPad on the 6th and, uh, and getting into this? Um, he's talking about the situations on the 9th, and that if, um, are you aware of an investigation team, First Amendment areas, that was objected to and sustained because it had to be in the scope of cross, the operation plan was an electronic format. He was asked if there was, um, if the maps would have been written on, and if they would have had handwritten notes to show routes and maybe water improvements, and whose property those water improvements were. And he said, well, it wouldn't say whose property it would, it would just ma mark location. And so shredding of those maps, that those locations may or may not be marked in the electronic copies. He said, uh, you know, there's lots of plans to protect um, the BLM and plans to protect, he's all, was there a plan to protect the public? And then he just says, well, there might have been. Was there a plan to protect the rights of the people? And he says, I don't know if there was a plan. That doesn't mean that there wasn't, that people don't have rights, but there wasn't a plan to protect the rights. He actually never saw the maps that went through or before they went through the shredder, so he cannot say if there was information on them that was exculpatory that the defense needed. We go into Whipple. He talks about the training. The, this agent from the BLM says they go through these training um, yearly that tells them how to deal with electronic information, how to keep all their information safe. And he said there's a, there's a difference between what the BLM is doing yearly required to take, which is every BLM officer, and it's an online thing, and it's pretty much the same every year, and it comes with some questions at the end, and the Criminal Justice Information Service policy. And pretty much totally different. Um, he a was asked, when did you read the superseding indictment? There was an objection to this, and relevant. Um, I believe she allows it. The person who wrote the indictment was the one who was giving you the scope of the investigation. Is that true or not? The judge here says, well, the green jury wrote the indictment. And he's like, yeah, under Stephen Myrie. Stephen Myrie controls the indictment. He's also the one that calls this BLM agent and gives him the scope of his investigation. This BLM agent was... Uh, reporting to Stephen Myrie weekly on the investigation and the rubber stamped it without ever even trying to get the shredded documents to see if they were actually there. So there was a lot of back and forth on who controlled it, talking to Stephen Myrie, and when he read the motion, and if he knew after reading that motion that the goal, if they found that there was destruction of evidence, that the case could be thrown out. And he tried to claim no, he was saying no and yes, he was going back and forth what, when he read the indictment, I mean at the beginning he said yeah, he read the indictment starting with, and um, then he's saying that no, and Stephen Myrie didn't give him his scope, the scope was based on the indictment, but then he's saying he read the indictment afterwards, or the motion of destruction of evidence, not indictment, motion of destruction of evidence, knowing that if he did find this, that it could be, throw the case out. And so that went out. So he, at the very end, he said, okay, the motion that you read, or you didn't read it, which one was it? You read it, or Myrie told you what to investigate? There was no expectations of results is his answer. 
So then Dan Hill gets up. And he asked her, and he starts asking about Myrie. He asked if he reviewed um, any of the documents with handwriting on it. He didn't. And he had pictures of the stuff with handwriting, yes, but he did not identify the items. He never asked the evidence to inspect it. He starts bringing up, uh, then we go into Tony Skaminsky. And this is in the last hour. So she is actually the one she testified in the first trial. She is the communications person. She had private messages between her and Robin Kirkham. Um, she's one of the ones I believe that Dan Love was talking about yesterday that was not listening to his commands. She worked with Dan Love at Burning Man at two other times. She talked about um, Pamela Smith and John Foley as her supervisor. Mary Hansen was in the truck um, at NPS. She was an arm protector or something. Randy Lavasser would have been in the trailer on the 12th and the 11th. Um, they said, you know, it's a, it's a her trailer is kind of like a need to be an only authorized personnel. Who would be authorized? Rand Stover, Zach Oper, Dan Love. They would have all been allowed, but she said there is no way that Dan Love was not in the trailer on the 11th or the 12th. Not at all. Which I believe his testimony and her testimony previously was different than that, I believe. Um, I know people are probably going to look into that. She's saying it's, it's a special trailer where people are listening to one thing and transcribing another, and so it's no speaking in the trailer. In fact, that's what Dan Love even said. And he talked about he was in there, but it was no speaking, so it, it, things are already conflicting. And it's because people are transcribing, so that she says no, no people would be in there. Um, and that her information that she works on is a need-to-know basis. Um, she was on site with the BLM at the, uh, or on the site the whole time from the 11th to the 12th. She slept in her vehicle. She's saying on the 11th, they were told that they could not go back to the hotel and that they were, um, that it wasn't a rushed shredding episode. That they were told to take one, one of their computer systems down. They took one computer system down. They put it in the vehicle. Um, she talks about information she would normally shred, the PII, which we've talked about with everything else. Any, Thing with phone numbers, identification, call names, any of that kind of stuff. Um, she said she doesn't recall how um, the information was given out on the 11th, but she was not told that people were coming and they were in danger. She was kind of upset and uh, about that, saying she wishes she were. It was one of those information weird situations and so she was asked well so it was calm on the 11th year there was no rush shredding and it was calm and you weren't told and she's like well it wasn't calm there was a lot that people didn't know but it wasn't a crazy situation which i believe is completely opposite of what she testified in the first trial um and then she said she was tr told to prepare to evacuate about 1 112 113 for mary over the radio up she believed then she's shown the pictures that were attached to the motion. These pictures are shredded documents. Um, she said, okay, so she's going through the, the different pictures and the pictures of the bag, she's like, well, nothing in this is identifiable. And I, I mean, very quickly, well, nothing in this is identifiable, nothing in this is identifiable. And then the close-ups of, of certain pieces out and she identifies things. She says stinker and, and this is about a hotel room and that, you know, that would be something we would shred because of this, and this has the for official use only, and, and that's something that we would have shredded that. She was also asked, you know, was there notepads and was there writing tools in this trailer for people to take handwriting? She said a lot of her team normally takes something, writes it, and then transcribes it, and she was working like she normally just hears it, transcribes it, like the court reporter does, and she was working with people that weren't as used to that yet already so that there was a possibility that people could be handwriting she also kept saying things like uh she said i do not recall a couple times and she said things like well i didn't see every piece of paper that went into the shredder 
Then at one point she said, well, there could have been rush shredding between midnight and 0900 in the morning. She's stating that's not, you know, there could have been shredding at that time when there was other people in the trailer. She said she was not in the trailer. She was in the trailer for the majority of the time on the 12th, besides the time in the early morning that she would have been sleeping or during the briefing. And um, that's pretty much all we got through with her. She will be um, first one up at 10 in the morning again tomorrow. We didn't even get through one person um, direct examining her. She seems very frustrated and kind of hostile, I would say. She's definitely got answer for everything very quick on it. Um, we will see, I believe there is, what, so we got through one and then an hour of the next person, so that we got to finish with her, and then there's one more person. At the rate this is going, it could take all week. The calendar call did not happen. We still have the calendar call to get through. Um, I am actually headed back, so I will not be here tomorrow. So um, hopefully we can get updates from someone else. Um, I know I will be waiting and watching as well. Um, not sure when the calendar, they didn't reschedule the calendar call. They're going to start again tomorrow morning at 10. So if you're down in Vegas and you can get down there, I know that they need people in the courtroom. Leave your cell phone at home because they're not going to keep it at the door. And um, be careful what you wear because the rules change daily. Other than that, um, more to come soon.